Everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, it's a bit of a crappy weather out there, but you, many of you made it. About 7 o'clock, it didn't look like there was going to be that many people, so I was a little disappointed. But uh, this is quite a wonderful crowd. All right. Okay, so... Advance. All right, so today what I'm going to do is, well, first of all, my name is Duncan. I'm the VP of product at OLX. Um, before my job uh, here at OLX, I worked for the company that owns OLX, Naspers. So if you logged on to the Wi-Fi, you'll have used the name here. But uh, so for the last three and a half years, which was before I started working at OLX, uh, my job was to travel around the world, uh, looking at all the different Naspers companies. Uh, Naspers has lots of different companies. Some of them are huge companies in Silicon Valley, uh, New York, uh, India, and some of them are like tiny little startups in Cape Town or in Turkey. So my job was to go to each of these different companies and try and figure out what they were doing right and what they were doing wrong and try and make them a little bit better. So I got a lot of exposure to all of these different ideas and different ways of organizing the companies. And so I'm going to try and share a little bit of what we are doing. Uh, here we go. So one of the things that surprised me, traveling around and seeing all these different companies, was that there was a whole bunch of different companies that had the same problems, right? There was a really, really big problem that was fucking up product management in many, many of these different pro uh, many, many of these different places, like Silicon Valley and uh, tiny little startups. So here's uh, when I got to OLX, they had the same problem, right? So what do I call this problem? I call it delivery culture, right? And so what does this mean and what are they doing wrong? Well, <laughs> wow, that just got really loud. <laughs> Holy shit. All right, so uh, delivery culture. So the key is in the name, right? These companies, they think the building stuff is gonna make them successful, right? And they don't mean, I don't mean just like building something, I mean building a lot of stuff, right? This is like the shotgun approach, right? We will just keep on shooting and we eventually we'll get something right, right? And this is super common. So one of the things that you see in these companies is that they always think that there's not enough devs, right? And they're always complaining like our devs are too slow, our backlog is enormously long and we will never get all this stuff done. Does that sound familiar, yeah. right? Everybody, th this is super common. Like I, I went to so many places and saw the same problem. So another thing is this huge backlog of ideas. Often it comes from people that are super high up, right? And those people rarely explain why they think this is a good idea, right? So what happens is you get a whole bunch of people looking at this and thinking like, why are we doing this? This is stupid. Does that sound familiar? Right? And so what happens is you end up with super low morale because you hire these really smart people to come into your company and then you treat them like people with shovels. Right? You're just like, hey, dig me a hole. Don't ask me questions about why. Just dig that hole. Dig it fast as well because we got plenty more holes to dig. <laughs> right? So this is a super common way of doing product management. Right? And what happens is when you just tell people to do all of these things but they don't understand why they're doing it, Often it doesn't fucking work because people don't know why they're doing it. So how can they make a good decision about when you have to choose between A or B, if you don't know why you're doing it, you got a 50-50 chance. So how did this happen? And why is this so common? Well, I think it really is all about this question. People don't know what the fuck product management does. Really, like so many times you go into a situation where people think that you are one of these three types of people, right? A very common situation, someone walks up to your desk and says, hey, product manager, I've got a great idea. You are going to love it. And what do they expect you to do? They expect you to grab your notepad and pencil and just write it down. Right? Because what you're going to do is you're going to write it down and then you're going to take it off, write it into a nice little spec, and you're going to take it over to the development kitchen. You're going to pop it in the oven. Right? And what's going to come out? Some tasty features. 
right? Now that's what they're thinking is gonna happen. Now, this is not really right. We are not fucking waiters, right? That's not what we are. So here's another one. Now these other two, these are more like how product managers see themselves, right? So this one in the middle, I call the product artist. You can notice he's got a beret, right? So the product artist, these guys are the ones that think they're Steve Jobs, right? They love saying stuff like, well, if I would ask customers, they would have told me I wanted a faster horse, right? How many people have heard that one? I am sick of hearing this. We are not Steve Jobs. That's not what product managers do. People always talk about Steve Jobs as being the greatest product manager. He was not a fucking product manager, <laughs> right? So what a product artist, you hear them say stuff like, oh, I've got this great idea. Trust me, it's going to work. The other type of people, when you say, really? Like, why do we want to do that? They get really offended because you should know that this idea should exist just because it's their idea and it's really good. That's the only reason, right? So that's the product artist. That's also not what we do. Third one, these are my favorites, right? Because they think they're way more sophisticated than everybody else, right? When you ask them, like uh, you ask them what, what they're doing or why they're doing it and they say, well, of course, we're, gonna, we're just gonna build it and A-B test it because there's, how could I possibly know if it's gonna work? I'm not a fortune teller. Right, so you hear them say stuff like A-B test everything, right? A-B test everything. And if you say, oh, you know what? I think we should change that button from like red to blue or we should change this text because it's not very good. And they'll say stuff like, cool. We need like 30 days to do a lot of like usability testing to make sure that this color change doesn't really like screw up the whole site. It's gonna take two seconds to change this, <laughs> right? We need 30 days to test it or I think this, this type of person is the product scientist, right? We are not submitting this change to a scientific journal, right? We are not gonna be peer reviewed about changing some text. So this is not something that we have to do. We are also not scientists, right? So what is it that we do? We're mixing art and science, right? We have to basically take a bit of risk and a bit of research and combine these things. Because every time we have an idea, a crazy new idea, right, should we just build it immediately? The product scientists would say we have to, right? We have to build, it's the only way we can know. But there is other ways we can know. We can do some research to, base, to limit the, t the number of times where we are gonna fuck up and do something stupid. That is what our job is. Right now, if you, if you go to your friends and they say, what do you do? And you say, I'm in product management. And they say, well, what, what is that? What does that do? If you say, I mix art and science, they'll probably tell you that you're an asshole, <laughs> right? Uh, so here's a simpler way of explaining to people in your organization or your friends or your mom, right? What it is that we do, right? Our job as product managers, put in very simple terms, is to make sure that we're not building stupid shit, <laughs> right? That's what we do, right? Development time and resources and the minutes and, you know, minutes and hours of our development team's life, it's precious, right? We have to be protective of this. We don't wanna waste their time building stupid things. So, how do we do this? This is what the, a, like a common development cycle looks like. Right over here, we have an idea. We do a little bit of research, think about it a little bit. Maybe we do an experiment, put it into like we write a little spec, hand it off to the developers, and around it goes. Gets into the customer's hands, and then maybe some insight comes out of it, and we come up with some new ideas. Right? At which point on this diagram does the amount of effort that we're spending on something go up a whole lot? Somebody call it out. Don't be shy. I'll give you a hint, it's the biggest button thing on the page. Right there. Right, at this point, the amount of effort that we're spending on something goes up a ton. Because so far, up until that point, it's just been me. Or maybe another UX guy, or maybe a conversation with a person here or there. But up until that point, it's just me. Right, I came up with this idea in the shower, 
have a think about it. I do a bit of research, right? I'm, I start to get more and more convinced that this is going to work. And then what? Eventually, I have to involve a development team, right? Now, if I choose to involve that development team, now it's a whole team of people. And they're all going to work on something that may be or may not be a really stupid idea, right? That's my job to make sure that I don't give them something stupid to do. Because if I do, it's going to kill their morale. It's going to waste their time, right? It's going to just piss people off in general. And we're not going to create anything. We're not going to create wins, which is what we get paid to do. So, okay, that's a bit slow. All right, so this is our job, right? Is balancing this risk. So how do we do this? This is the best tool I've ever seen to describe what we're supposed to do over in that red zone, right? This is called the truth curve. So how does this work, right? Well, if I just have a random idea, I'm in the shower this morning, I had this idea, right? If I just keep this idea to myself or I just write it down into a spec immediately, right? This is where I am. This is fantasy land, right? I have no evidence that this is a good idea or a bad idea other than my own imagination, right? So what, do I, what can I do? How can I reduce the amount of risk that I'm going like, to put onto the development team, right? I can do it in a simple way, right? And this kind of helps you to remember that there's options, Right, so how this works is, this is the truth, right? This is the amount of truth that you can get out of something or the amount of certainty that you have something is gonna work. And this is how much effort it takes you to get a little bit more certainty, right? So there's all kinds of stuff. Like this is not an exhaustive list at all. There's like a million different things that you can do to, to, to get a bit more certainty. But basically what you should always be doing is starting here at the easiest possible thing you can do. And then you move up a little bit every time. So if I come out of the shower and I'm like, hey, I've got this, got this great idea. First thing I should do, just ask somebody. Hey, I got this idea. What do you think? This is, if somebody says, oh, that's a terrible idea, then this is where the art comes in, right? Because there's no certainty around this. This is your judgment. If that person says, I think that's a terrible idea, here is why. Then it's up to you. Do you believe this? Did they convince you that this is a stupid idea? If they didn't convince you, what do you do? Go a little further up. Ask a couple more people. Go and ask four people. If all four of them tell you it's a stupid idea, then you've got to be brave, <laughs> right? That's when you start saying, well, you know, maybe it's the wrong audience, right? This is where confirmation bias gets really dangerous, right? So th this is basically what product management is supposed to do. We are supposed to look at this. And then if we start to get slightly convinced, it's really a good idea to start involving development right away. Go and talk to your favorite developer and say, hey, how long do you think this would take to build? If they say it's like 30 seconds, should you spend a couple of days researching it? What do you think? Probably not, right? It's going to take you longer to research it than it is to build it. And if you build it, you have immediate certainty, right? If it works, you know. So. This is how you're supposed to do this. Now, a really important thing to remember is when you're looking at the amount of development time, this is a really big and important factor because this is how you're going to balance whether or not you should just build it or how much certainty you need. If I tell you, if you ask your developer and they say, oh, it's going to take six months, do you think it's worth doing three weeks worth of research? Probably, right? It's probably not a good idea to just be like, you know what, I've got a really good feeling about this one. Probably not a good idea. All right, so this sounds simple, right? It sounds very simple, right? But why are people not doing this? Well, it's, it's kind of hard to set up your organization to do this. So let's have a little look. But first of all, the approach. Because if I don't show you what, like how I kind of thought about this, and what I use to, to think about how to organize uh, or set up an organization, it's not going to make a whole bunch of sense because you don't know how I'm judging the tools that I'm choosing. So very quickly, these books were very influential for me. I read them like, I don't know how long ago, a long time ago. And these books are really awesome books. Right? So I highly recommend you read them. But here is the very, very short version. 
right? This book, uh, the first book there is called Drive. It's by a guy named Dan Pink. The whole book is basically on this slide. It's, you should still read it though, it's very good. Um, but basically, his whole theory comes down to that there's, you, you can't motivate people. They have to, you, all you can do is set up an environment where they can be motivated, right? So how do you do this? Well, there's three major components, mastery, autonomy, and purpose, right? Now, these three things are kind of basic human desires. So mastery is kind of a simple one. People want to get better at shit, right? They want to be in a place where they can be challenged so they can feel like they're making progress. This is like an intrinsic human desire. If you take that away from people, watch them put on the frowny face, right? Autonomy, the same thing. Nobody likes to be micromanaged, right? Nobody, like, not even the people that are doing the micromanaging like doing it. So you need to be able to give people the freedom to make decisions. This is also really closely linked to mastery because if you don't get to make any decisions, how can you ever get any better at anything? Because people keep telling you what to do. You're not making those decisions. And the third one is purpose. Who likes to do things that are totally pointless? Not a lot, right? So these things, these are the three principles. Uh, now, a little bit of more detail about the first one, which is called Mastery, uh, is in the second book. Uh, the second book is called Flow. And this, I love this graph. Right, so this is challenges versus skills, right? And this in the middle, as you might have guessed, is this. That's the flow. So you should be giving people tasks that are challenging, they're difficult enough for their skill level that it's gonna be challenging, right? So you wanna give them something that's a little bit difficult, but not too difficult. Because as soon as you get, give them something that's too difficult, what happens? People freak out, right? They get super stressed. They, they, they're just not ready for this kind of level of difficulty. And what happens if you give somebody something that's way too easy to do? They get bored, right? You've, and not only that, you're, you're kind of wasting their life because you're not giving them anything very difficult to do. So anyway, these are the ways that I was looking at this and deciding which tools to select. They have to, be, they have to support these principles. Okay, so where do we start? Right? The objective of this was to try and change a delivery culture into a learning culture. Right? Now, what are the principles of the, of the delivery culture? We talked about these a minute ago. A lot of ideas coming from above. Right? In a learning culture, we need people to realize that ideas are not the most valuable thing that we have. Right? It's time and opportunity and morale. These things are way more valuable. It's so easy to fill up an enormous list of crazy, stupid shit to do, right? It's way harder to actually build all that stuff, right? You can come up with a terrible idea in one second. It could take six months to build that thing, right? So ideas are cheap, and I don't care where they come from. If the idea comes from the CEO, it has the same value. You still have to check if it's going to be a good idea or not. So another one is we need to remove this idea that building equals success. Right? Building does not equal success. The only thing that we want, that I want my team to think about, is that the only thing that I want, and I keep saying this all the time, the only currency I accept is wins. Right? And that means customer impact. Did what you do, like did the thing that you built, did that actually change customer behavior? In a positive way, please. All right, and we need to get rid of this constant pressure to build faster, right? Because unless you give people time to think about stuff, what happens? You're gonna build stupid things. And then what happens? You get more freaked out because it's not working. Why? Because you didn't think about it before you did it. And then what happens? More pressure, build it even faster. And people start, this is, this is the way it's just our spiral where you get organizations that become these terrible pressure boxes. So what do we want instead of this? We want a desire, like an intrinsic desire. I want the teams to try and like, I want them to feel like they want to generate wins, right? And if we give them autonomy and give them a place where they can practice and get better at this, and we tell them that this is how we're going to judge them, they'll want to do it themselves. Because I believe what this book says, that getting better at something is an intrinsic desire. We just have to give you an environment where you can do this. So we need to change 
from these kind of major ideas, like the whole company thinking like this, uh, and the whole idea is like, trust me, this is going to work. Right? We need to get away from this completely and change it to, I'm not sure, let's check if this is going to work. Right? A humility rather than just this kind of blind confidence. Like this is the delivery culture, whether like the, co the culture realizes it or not, it's a very arrogant culture because you think you know what people want. Realistically, we need to be way more humble and realize that we don't know what people are going to want. Okay, so the big reveal. What did we choose? How did we choose it? So here's what we chose, right? This is our solution. Basically, OKRs, RPD, and CFT. Ooh, a whole bunch of letters. All right, so like I said, these tools that we selected, they need to be able to support these principles because if we're not basically holding these things up, the whole thing just falls apart. So the first one is OKRs. Who has heard of OKRs before? Oh, look at this, a couple of people, all right. Now, who can tell me what O stands for? Yes, look at that, some participation. All right, so yes, OKR stands for objectives and what's the KR? Key results. What is a very famous company that uses OKRs? Google, yes, Google uses OKRs, okay. So here we go, why did we choose OKRs? Well, you guys know that I love autonomy, right? And OKRs allows me to make a deal with my teams, right? So I just have a conversation with my teams this is an essential part of the OKR process. We discuss what it is your, that the, your objective is going to be, right? We agree on what that objective is, and then we agree how we're going to measure it. That's the objective and the key result, right? So the objective is kind of the grand purpose. Does that sound familiar? Purpose, right? So the objective gives us a very clear idea of what it is that we're trying to achieve. What is your team's what is, what is your team's impact on customers? The best kind of objectives are written like this. So it's very clear what it is that you're trying to do and who it's going to affect. So I want it in real human terms. That's the best kind of objective. And then we set the KRs so we know how we're going to measure this, which allows you to get into this mastery thing because you'll know whether or not you're actually doing a good job and you're getting better at this, right? So... And of course, the autonomy, which is actually the biggest part of OKRs, because if we agree on what it is that you that I want you to do, right, and what you think that you can achieve, I don't have to micromanage you. Because I mean, how does micromanagement work? Micromanagement is is basically when somebody tells you a very vague idea of what they want you to do, right, and then when you start doing it, you don't do it exactly like what they wanted in their heart. Right? And then what happens? They're like, oh, fuck, this is not exactly what I wanted. And then they start getting in your business and trying to make you change it without telling you exactly what it is. Terrible. Not even, not even the people that are doing that like doing it because they're disappointed because you didn't do what they wanted. And you hate it too. Everyone hates it. It's terrible. So OKRs is a great solution for this. All right? So next one. All right, so RPD, who's heard of that? Ah, you're right, nobody's heard of that because we made it up. <laughs> right? We made this up, we made it in this, this building, right? We came up with this, this method. So you guys are the first people outside of this team to have seen this. Lucky you, right? All right, so how does it work? The idea behind the whole thing, first of all, for responsible product development is to create a repeatable process, right? And it's to keep all, like my team, honest because you know what I expect, right? What I expect is you to filter stuff before you give it to the development team. And so how do we do this? How do I make this into a system that I can check, that I also don't have to get on your back and micromanage you, that works out nicely with OKRs? Well, this is how it works. Instead of having one backlog where we just put all the stuff that we want developers to, you know, it's like when you go to the kitchen and you stick all those things up, you know what I mean? Instead of having one of those lists where we just want all the developers to do all these things, we have three. So the first one is called the problem opportunity assessment, 
right? So anybody in the company can come to you and say, hey, I've got this idea. Cool. What questions am I going to ask? I'll give you a hint. They're on the bottom. <laughs> all right? Now, the way that this works is all of my teams know that at any moment, if I look at their problem opportunity assessment or problem opportunity backlog, right, what I want to see and what I might ask at any moment is, hey, what, what problem does this solve? And they better have an answer, right? Because they know in advance, they've seen this. They know I'm going to ask these questions. If it's not there, that's just stupid, right? So these are the questions that every, everything on that backlog needs to have an answer to. So you put these random ideas on there, and then, well, actually, wait a minute, important detail. If you are on the growth team and someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got this great idea for monetization, should you put it on this list? No, right? Because you have OKRs, right? You can tell them, hey, look, this is what my objective is. It doesn't fit with my objective. So I'm not like, you know, you, you're talking to the wrong guy. You should go talk to the other guy. So that's how we decide what to put on this list, first of all, right? But now, now that you've got this list, you can start to interview people that come to you. Head of business development comes to you and says, hey, I've got this great idea. You already know what questions to ask them. If you're a product manager, you can say, well, what problem does this solve? Right? So now when they come to you and expect you to get your pad out, you can get your questions out. What problem does this solve? How do you know this is a problem? How big is this problem? Right? If you don't know the answers to these questions, you probably shouldn't be building it. Right? So that's the problem opportunity assessment. Now, once, you, once you've come up with how big this problem is and you have evidence that this is a problem because you can tell how big it is, you have numbers according to this, right? then you can decide where on the list this goes and how do you rank it. Well, your job, if you're using OKRs, is you've got about three months to change this number. So you're going to rank this stuff in, in order of how much impact these things are going to have on your objectives. Right? So once you have the evidence, right, and you know how big this problem is, you put it at the top of the list, then it's time to move it over to the solution discovery phase. What do you think you do there? Discover solutions. Right? So this is where you can start coming up with ideas for, okay, we know this is a problem. How can we solve this problem? Right? But that's not the first thing. You don't just like, oh, okay, I've got a feature. Now this is it. I'm, I'm just going to build this thing. You need to check this, right? Again, you need to start looking at what evidence do I have that this is going to work? How do we know it works? This is where you do stuff like usability testing. Right? Okay. So anyway, once you've, once you've done this and you've answered these questions, then and only then can you hand it off to development. Because then you can be pretty sure that it's you've got a good likelihood that this is going to work. That's why it's called responsible product development. Right? Nobody asked me this. Right? No, I think only one person has ever asked me, why did you call it responsible product development? Because not doing this and not doing the research beforehand is irresponsible. You're wasting other people's time. All right. So this is, what, this is how you do it. And here's the rituals for this. I just kind of stuck these in here to give you some insight in case you wanted to look at the deck later. And here we go. So why, why did we come up with this? I mean, I told you why we came up with that, why we used the, the OKRs thing. Why did we do this? Right, well, if, you've, if you look closely, you can see the reason why, right? All of these things. All of those principles that we are using to try and design the organization are all included here, right? This one, for example, right? The, the responsible product development, it makes the purpose of things very clear. If you're an Android developer and somebody tells you, hey, man, I want you to build this thing, right? You, you go to your development backlog, you look at this thing, and you get, your, you get your story or your spec, and you look at this and say, wow, this is stupid. This is a really stupid thing to do. In many organizations, what can you do? Nothing. You just build it, right? But in this, in this system, you can trace it back. From here, you can track it back to here. 
and to see, and have a look at like how did they know that this was going to work? Did they like, did they usability test this? Because this seems stupid. And then you look, you watch these videos, and you're like, wow, okay, it seems like it does work, right? Or you're like, wow, this is a stupid idea. I don't understand why anyone would do this. You can go all the way back here and look at what kind of problem they're solving and how they got the evidence for doing this. So you might think it's a crazy, stupid idea to add the language Urdu to your app in Pakistan. But when you look, go all the way back here and you see like, man, 60% of the population speaks Urdu and they don't speak any other language. That seems like a pretty good growth opportunity. So this is, this is one of the reasons why, why we came up with this. Another one is the, the autonomy, right? If I tell you that I am going to ask you these questions, then I can stop bothering you. Right? I can get out of your way because you know that I'm going to ask you these questions. I don't need to be walking around and checking on what you're doing all the time because I know that you know that that's how I'm going to be checking on you. Autonomy, another one of my favorite words. And then mastery. Because we're checking this stuff and you can see how, how your win rate is going up when you're putting these things out, you can start to get a sense of pride in the fact that you're getting better at detecting stupid ideas. Because that's what you should be, right? Like a mind detector for stupid ideas. All right. So the last one here, CFT. Cross-functional teams. Who's heard of that? Well, this is probably the most popular one on here, right? Every, everybody seems to be using cross-functional teams these days. So cross-functional teams, it fits really well with this because it creates autonomy. It's really hard to feel like you own something and you can make an impact on something when you're waiting for somebody else to do something. Especially if you're using OKRs. If we don't have cross-functional teams, the whole OKRs thing doesn't work, right? Because if, if you've only got three months to deliver on something and you end up waiting for a month for testing, then you're probably screwed. You're not going to make it. And it can be a very frustrating experience. So thanks, Spotify, for the, uh, the drawing. They came up with the, the drawing. It's very nice. Um, yeah. So anyway, how do all these pieces, uh, pieces of the puzzle fit together? Right now, you might have noticed that if... We didn't use cross-functional teams, OKRs wouldn't work, right? So a lot of these things, you can look at these tools and you can try and make it work for your organization, but you have to be super careful that these things are actually compatible with other parts of your organization. If you work in a gigantic organization that has like a development organization, right? And you work in the product organization and you guys don't hang out and don't talk, that's a problem. It's a different problem for a different talk. But, but this is probably not going to work. Right? If you have OKRs, like individual OKRs, terrible idea. You probably find a blog post that tells you it's an awesome idea, but it's not a good idea. Uh, but you really have to be careful about how you think about which pieces and which tools you're going to use. Because if you use the tool in the wrong organization where it doesn't fit with the other stuff, you are going to think that this tool sucks and it totally doesn't work. Anyway, that's it. <laughs>